Good afternoon and welcome to this seminar webinar. My name is Nora Owen and I'm pleased to welcome you to the fifth lecture in the 2022 Development Matters series, which is supported by Irish Aid. Uh, just some housekeeping before we start. Um, please note that the initial address and the questions and answers will be on the record. Um, and I will ask you when either during the, the talk or after to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the end of your screen. Um, I would like you to identify yourself if possible if you put in a question and maybe give the name of your organisation if you're representing an organisation. And we also encourage our guests to tweet using the handle at IIEA and we also welcome those watching through YouTube. Um, our speaker today, we are delighted to be joined by Ms. Osa Regnier, who is the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director, Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. And thank you so much, Osa, for being here. Osa has been the Assistant Secretary General of the UN and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women since May 2018. Prior to this, she served as Minister for Children, the Elderly and Gender Equality of Sweden. And um, she has an enormous extensive experience in the area of gender equality and women's empowerment, having held various leadership positions in government and in NGOs and in the United Nations. She has led important processes and campaigns as a leading advocate for feminism and gender equality in Sweden. Um, beyond where we, uh, and before we hear uh, from Osa, um, as you know, the title of her address is Conflict Related Sexual Violence in Humanitarian Emergencies. And we're very glad today to welcome His Excellency Michael Gaffey from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And Michael is going to say a few words about this series of lectures, and then I will hand over to, he will hand over to Osa. So thank you very much, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nora, thank you very much. And it is a real honor for me to uh, be speaking at this IIEA Development Matters event but especially to, uh, to introduce someone as uh, significant as Osa Regner on a subject that is really vital and shamefully so. Uh, addressing conflict-related sexual <laughs> violence and humanitarian emergencies should, of course, not be a priority, but it is stunning, really, to think that in every humanitarian emergency and in every conflict that we face these days, se se sexual violence is being used as a weapon. And it is, as I said, a badge of shame, I would say, on humanity. So eradicating gender-based violence uh, is par as part of support for gender equality and achieving accountability is vital for peace building, for humanitarian action, for upholding human rights and supporting sustainable development. And it is crucial for the, uh, for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And in fact, I think it is something that we need to state over and over again, that we will not achieve or make progress in the sustainable development goals without a really strong and determined focus on gender equality and on the empowerment of women and girls. Um, this is a priority for Ireland in our aid programme and in our foreign policy. And I should say that we are proud that Ireland has become a leading voice on women, peace and security and on addressing uh, sexual and gender based violence, not least in our last two years, in the past two years, as an elected member of the Security Council. But we finish our term at the end of this year and it will remain <clears throat> a priority for our development and humanitarian program and in our foreign policy. I won't go into the details, but I will say that in our humanitarian uh, spending, uh, we prioritize uh, this issue. Uh, and we know that, uh, we know from our partnerships, the importance of increasing resources for the creation of safe spaces for women and girls. Uh, and in particular, I would highlight our partnership with the International Rescue Committee. Uh, and I would also highlight the absolutely vital work that is needed to change the attitudes of men and boys and address harmful <laughs> notions of masculinity. Attitudinal shifts during time of peace or relative stability can and will have a knock-on effect in reducing rates of gender-based violence during conflict. So 
I, I, on a more positive note, I would say that the humanitarian system has never been more effective than it is today, but unfortunately has never been more needed than it is today, and has never faced a greater series of interlocking challenges than it does today. But although needs are increasing, millions more people are reached each year, including more people at risk of sex sexual and violence. And it is therefore incumbent on all of us to make sure that we continue to work together to reach those most vulnerable and most in need. And I am really pleased now to invite uh, Osa Regner to deliver her remarks. Thank you very much. Good morning and thank you so much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, I should say. Uh, good morning from New York. I am, I am the one who is very honored uh, to be with you today. And I really want to thank all of you at the Institute of uh, International and Euro European Affairs for inviting me. I also want to thank uh, Ireland and Irish Aid for all the support to you and women uh, and for, to Ireland as a country, for, as a donor and partner to us but also for, let's say, everyday discussions and interaction on these important topics, not least during Ireland's time in the Security Council, but really in general, uh, that um, Ireland as a country is very both uh, involved and, and uh, very supportive to our work. So I want to express that because you're all part of, of that and we, we um, really uh, um, uh, benefit from that engagement. So this, the topic of today uh, is, of course, a very unfortunately uh, well, top of mind uh, a topic because so many armed conflicts are going on in the world and where women also suffer uh, sexual violence in those conflicts. And I'm thinking, of course, of Ukraine, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, which has now come up again, uh, uh, Sahel, um, Haiti as well, uh, it's a bit of another situation there, but still uh, as well as um, many other countries around the world. <clears throat> and as we uh, also heard, uh, the, this violence is mostly, uh, well, it, it is almost always committed by men and by far mostly against women, but it also happens that men are victims and survivors of uh, sexual violence in armed conflict. Um, we also know that <clears throat> when it comes to um, this, this kind of violence in armed conflict, it is from the side of the perpetrator quite an effective way to both violate rights and dignity of the woman, which is, <clears throat> which is most, mostly the case, but it also weakens whole societies. And sometimes it is not only sexual violence, but actually sexual violence that leads to killings and murder. And that also makes, if the woman in question has small children, they are uh, less likely to survive, etc. So this is really a weapon in the sense that you can weaken whole societies uh, do through this uh, form of, of violence, uh, violence uh, and especially when it is used as a weapon, let's say. Um, <clears throat> so the United Nations documented almost 3,300 cases of conflict-related sexual violence, which <clears throat> since we know it is very underreported, for many reasons, and I'll go into them. To them, uh, we think that these three thousand three hundred cases are just a small fraction of those that actually happened. In twenty twenty one, last year, uh, the Secretary General reported in his annual report on conflict related sexual violence that uh, parties to conflict. Um, uh, that we, we have we seen these uh, um, crimes in uh, where, where perpetrators of these crimes remained active in uh, the Central African Republic, in uh, DRC, in Iraq, in Mali, Myanmar, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, and Syria. Um, we uh, as I mentioned before, we also see and have reports about um, uh, 
conflict-related sexual violence in other crisis settings in Ukraine, uh, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. And as always, it is really important to try to, as, as early as possible, document and investigate, and investigate uh, these crimes. I also want to say uh, from the outset that here we talk about women as victor victims or more importantly survivors and whatever we do should be informed by survivors demands and experiences and claims. Women are however also leaders and we do know that when we support women as leaders that is actually also part of the solution to peace in general when women are um, allowed, so to speak, to be the leaders that they are and have the right to be, that actually helps communities stay together and it also helps uh, sustain peace uh, in communities. To come back to, however, these crimes and the situation uh, around them, we know that an, a giant problem is impunity. The Special Rapporteur uh, on Sexual Violence uh, in Conflict said recently that conflict-related sexual violence is war's oldest, most silenced, and least condemned crime. We know that impunity remains the rule and justice, uh, and, and impunity remains the rule and justice is the rare exception. We also know that services for survivors are scarce. We also know that the psychosocial needs that many of the survivors ha have are mostly unmet, especially in humanitarian settings. We know as well that the stigma that survivors suffer is so intense sometimes that some of them choose uh, to remain with their abusers uh, instead of returning to their communities or their loved ones. We also know to come back to men's responsibility and, and the um, patriarchies that most of us live in. And we also know that many of the armed conflicts actually can happen in very male dominated uh, regions and areas. And we know that when uh, decision, since decision making in these areas is often is largely ma male dominated, uh, and especially in the peace and security arena, where peace talks, if they occur, uh, unfortunately still seldom include women, we know that these crimes still go unattended many times. So therefore, obviously, we need to strengthen our efforts to understand uh, how to address uh, conflict-related sexual violence in a, in, in a broader way. Uh, and again, not only to protect women's and girls' rights, although that's the most important thing because they have the rights, these rights, and it's about their lives. But we also know, as I said, that it helps achieve durable peace and to keep societies together. Uh, we also know that despite the scale of the problem, uh, we know uh, how today to prevent con conflict related sexual violence. It's not uh, a natural disaster. It's not an inevitable consequence of conflict. We can prevent it. And to talk about it like today is one way of doing that and to raise knowledge and awareness. So we need to understand that uh, conflict-related sexual violence entails, uh, uh, what it entails and what the main causes and consequences are. It's crucial to understand that although conflict marks an abrupt disruption from peacetime and social, political and economic systems and nor norms often result in unparalleled levels of violence and viciousness, Conflict-related sexual violence does not occur in a void. Conflict sexual uh, related sexual violence occurs within the structures of patriarchy, as I said before, male dominance in societies and gender inequality, which are also present in peacetime. And it manifests itself as an exacerbated, often utilitarian, systematic and brutal form of gender-based violence. 
Also, we know that in war or conflict time, the violence from men uh, towards women li live, with, live with in civilian settings also increase. Accordingly, when we talk about conflict sex related sexual violence, we do refer to rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, forced abortion, and forced uh, sterilization, forced marriage, and any other form of sexual violence that is comparably grave. And that is directly or indirectly linked to a conflict which also um, entails related uh, trafficking in person for the, for the purpose of sexual violence or exploitation. So conflict-related sexual violence is very uh, complex, obviously, uh, and it uh, arises from multiple and many different forms of root causes. But the most prominent one, obviously, is gender inequality and the lower value of women uh, and the, um, the power that men have in their hands in these uh, societies to start with. So to tackle these root causes, it is really important to address uh, conflict sec uh, related sexual violence um, uh, early on and also in peacetime. So prevention, like everyday prevention, is the best way of protecting and addressing gender inequality because it really is a root cause. Data shows, for example, that states that, that have higher levels of gender equality on, at the outset are less likely to resort to the use of this kind of violence. Promoting gender equality in daily life, let's say, is therefore key to prevent uh, both conflict and conflict-related sexual violence. Uh, so what can we do? This is not easy. It's part of what UN Women does on a daily basis. Obviously, we need to promote women's social and economic empowerment. And in fact, when we ask women in conflict zones in Ukraine, Libya, that we asked um, uh, recently in service, uh, what they, uh, and also in Afghanistan, actually, what they themselves need the most, uh, they say, my own income and my own rights. Thereafter, they can deal with violence, they can deal with other issues, but to promote women's own income through paid work and economic empowerment is really important. Also, to ensure women's access to services uh, and gender responsive justice, extremely important, as well as to support the, uh, the development of gender responsive rule of law institutions, which actually function, and most importantly, to protect and promote women's leadership through legislation and with resources, uh, including through the adoption and financing of national action plans on women, peace and security, according to the Security Council Resolution 1325. And we know that they actually have an impact when they are there and when there is a budget that goes with them. So these are examples of the kind of action that you and women includes close cooperation with women's civil society organizations, national governments and UN partners do undertake in both development settings as well as humanitarian settings, conflict effect in conflict affected countries and, um, uh, and those also that have been uh, affected by climate change where we often see both disasters and conflicts which are uh, triggered by climate change. Um, you and women, uh, this, these are the kinds of action we are also trying to promote through something called the Women, Peace, Security and Humanitarian Action Compact. Um, and this was launched last year at the Generation Equality Forum in uh, Paris. And uh, this compact and other prevention efforts by the United Nations include, for example, systematic training of peacekeepers to detect, deter and respond to sexual violence. It is about supporting communities in the establishment of local protection committees and early warning mechanisms. It's about the negotiation and support to the implementation of joint communiques 
and frameworks of cooperation with national governments on the response uh, to conflict, the prevention and response of uh, conflict-related sexual violence. And it is also the engagement with non-state armed groups in uh, who commit sexual violence, for example, in the context such as the Central African Republic, Mali and South Sudan. So these are some of the efforts which are led by the uh, SRSG on sexual violence, the, the uh, Special Representative of Sexual Violence, as well as the UN Department of Keep Peacekeeping Operation, and is supported by UN Women and the UN system as a whole. Also to say something on Ukraine, uh, because we all have the Ukraine situation on uh, uh, our minds. The uh, Special Rapporteur on uh, Sexual uh, Violence signed a framework of uh, cooperation with the governments of Ukraine on behalf of the United Nations. And you and women will be the implementing, one of the implementing partners. And in that agreement, they agreed that the UN will provide technical support um, to the government on uh, prevention and response. Also to work together with local women civil society partners to support, to strengthen them and to provide legal assistance to, to survivors throughout the country, very important. And also to work with the partners on strengthening the capacities of the sec security sector to prevent and respond. Uh, and again, it's really, really important to, to, to promote justice and accountability, which addresses both pre prevention and response. We have also uh, sent experts to the uh, Human Rights Council mandated investigations of the sexual violence. And as you know, there's already been reports from them. Um, so it is very important to, uh, to ensure access to survivor-centered justice and reparations for victims in these contexts. Uh, and there we have the best chance to, to interact and to mend to the deep wounds and to support uh, women to be, come back to a dignified life that they themselves can design. So UN Women has deployed for the, during the last 10 years more than 100 experts on justice uh, for sexual violence in conflict. And we also work in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, DRC, Mali and Ukraine, etc. Colombia is another country where UN Women is very active and you, I'm sure you know that in the peace uh, agreement there, it actually has very clear language on gender equality and uh, conflict, uh, sexual violence, uh, violence related matters. So this is a whole uh, of UN effort. Uh, and we also always need our partners like yourselves in this. And uh, obviously, as I said, these the services that the survivors um, um, need and ask for is uh, immediate medical care, including sexual and reproductive health care in humani humanitarian settings, psychosocial support and other activities that connect survivors to, um, uh, to for, for them to be able to focus on healing, on empowerment and recovery. Um, they again, in the very early, need offers on socioeconomic and livelihood support. Uh, and as well, again, legal aid and legal, um, legal advice that really accompanies them. Um, we also have to uh, conclude something that is called the Women, Peace and Humanitarian Fund, which is also funded by some of the member states, which we have been able to use lately, both in Ukraine and Afghanistan, for example, where we can channel rapid, rapid and flexible funding to women's organizations who respond to crisis and who in their turn defend uh, uh, women's rights in conflict. Uh, this has shown to be a very uh, effective tool. And I want to point out that uh, women's organizations in the world are really doing a tremendous job to protect and defend other women, but many of them experience shrinking space, including threats against them, themselves uh, uh, doing this work. They're also heavily underfunded in uh, most of these settings. So um, I 
want to conclude by just saying that we are very honored and uh, humbled uh, to be working together with you and to be in these kinds of spaces and to discuss uh, these enormously important uh, issues uh, that unfortunately are high on the agenda uh, right now. And we need to, as part of the daily gender equality work, really address in an age appropriate and respectful, but still clear way, the contributions that men and boys can make to gender equality and how men and boys can also contribute to a better world with more of justice for women and girls. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Osa. And uh, it is such a frightening um, topic that you've raised with us. When you look at the list that you listed, was it isn't just sexual violence, it's rape, it's sexual slavery, it's prostitution, sterilize, enforced sterilization, um, enforced early marriages um, and, and, and uh, forced abortions. I mean, I wonder at this stage, we, we've known for years that, that sexual violence forms part of, I suppose, the, what goes on in a, in a conflict re, a conflict situation and that it is used as, I suppose, a weapon of war. What success have you had in um, talking to the leaders of the countries where this is going on. I mean, these are their soldiers. These are these, their, their troops and they are their women and girls who are being treated like this. Is there, is there any kind of dialogue going on with the leaders of some of these countries? You're listed in several countries, so I know some of them probably difficult, but there are countries that you feel you should be able to talk to. Just would you fill that in for us, please? Well, thank you very much. Yes, obviously, <clears throat> this can be done on different levels. And as you say, it is uh, difficult in um, depending on the situation in the country and also what the, the character of the de facto authority or the government, uh, or, and if there even is a government. But I mean, in the countries where we work, UN Women is present in 80 different countries. Uh, and part of our daily work is to engage with the governments on gender equality. And, and that almost always includes violence against women in different forms. So in the best of cases, we already have that dialogue and those channels, so to speak, open. Then I, I know uh, for the women themselves, the justice piece is extremely important. So it is, you know, whatever we can do to facilitate that <clears throat> through investigations, through strengthening the judicial systems, uh, you know, uh, as part of the prevention uh, and so on is also really important. And I, I actually do see in the world, and we can, we just had the open debate in the Security Council um, now two weeks ago, or even last week, where I am impressed every year by the fact that member states literally line up <laughs> to speak into you know the, uh, late night hours uh, because there are so many uh, who want to talk about sexual violence so nowadays this is really a topic that that governments are very aware of and most of them also feel they have to engage if you say what i mean in on some level the problem we have however is that that engagement and the increased awareness all good things are not reflected enough in action. So what we need is systems for implementation. It is for governments to actually say, yes, this is as important as other atrocities happening during this war or this conflict. And we need for governments and donors to invest, uh, invest in this work either as donors or as governments uh, in the countries. And that is lacking to a large extent. And that's why we also don't really see women as part of peace, um, uh, um, uh, those who sign uh, peace agreements or even those who sit around the table uh, when peace is discussed. And I think unfortunately that to a too large extent, the mindset that those who cause the violence are the only legitimate partners to discuss how to stop the violence and what will happen uh, after that. Although we have evidence that women's presence actually makes a difference. So there are different ways to do that, uh, but it takes a long time and it's, it's complicated. 
I, I mean, uh, just going to the most recent uh, war that's on in Ukraine, and we've heard already that there are uh, there's evidence of sexual violence in, in that war as well. But one of the problems that comes across is that it takes so long and so much research to actually bring cases. Um, I just wondered in, in the Ukraine situation, is there much evidence of child trafficking? Um, there is evidence obviously of sexual abuse, rape, but I just wonder getting in at the start of this war, which is, which is the most recent one, is it possible to get to grips with preventing the trafficking? We have instance here in Ireland of one case that's being examined where, where a child doesn't seem to be the child of the man yeah. that she's with. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered, is there early intervention that you can make in, 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 in somewhere like Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that this, this uh, from the outset, I think this time um, different actors with responsibilities were more aware than ever. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that helped to, uh, to a large extent. I think that the European Union, Union and, the, and un the United Nations tried really to work together and to raise awareness. However, in the beginning of, of, of a war, and that was the case in Ukraine as well, it's very chaotic. And, and, uh, um, but I, I, the, the issue was certainly top of mind from the beginning. <clears throat> there are also several instances where we, that women can turn to and campaigns online and in other ways to reach women. Uh, and uh, also hopefully children in these situations so that they know about their rights and where they, they can uh, go in uh, countries of, of uh, recipient countries. Uh, although many are of course also still within uh, Ukraine. We had a seminar at UN Women together with OSSE, together with OSSC, the EU, uh, the UN and civil society. And I think that's the way to go forward to compare really who is doing what and how, how can we uh, also uh, prosecute these cases. Uh, so that is ongoing work. But you might have seen the report on the 23rd of September, I think it was from um, the first report uh, from the uh, investigate, uh, investigators uh, from the Human Rights Council. And even for me and for us who work with this on an everyday uh, basis, it's very difficult uh, reading because it is just uh, it, it's, it's just horrendous what happens and whether, for example, are uh, evidence of rape, both of four-year-olds and 82-year-olds and very little respect of, of life and, um, uh, and, and uh, dignity uh, and rights. I, on the trafficking piece, we also kind of stated that we need to continue to follow this because it also becomes after a certain time like as you described, perhaps it after several months, it comes out in other forms like mm -hmm. Ukrainian uh, women, um, uh, blonde Ukrainian women escorts and happy faces online for as if it, it weren't trafficking. It's, it's something much more glamorous in the eyes of the uh, of the buyer of the of this, uh, uh, or I would say exploiters, because <laughs> who doesn't know why why women leave Ukraine? Uh, but but I think that uh, we learn a lot as we go from Ukraine because it is happening now and it's in social media, both the the, uh, the parts that empower women and those who make women victims, uh, and and. Um, we also have on early on investigators in the country. So it's a little bit too early, I think, to say what can what, what is actually uh, the success, successful methods, but at least I, I think the international community has really been aware and on it from the outset. Yes. Sorry for long answer. No, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, I think what you're saying, the message you're giving is that it's up to each of the countries that are taking in um, refugees from Ukraine 
to be be aware that this is a problem yeah, yeah. and might be a problem Absolutely. with trafficking. I see uh, Kian uh, Fitzgerald, one of our re senior researchers in the Institute, I think you have answered. He says, could, could you comment further on the gendered components of Russia's war and the role of the UN? Well, I think you've answered that really. It, you're very well mm -hmm. aware of it. I have another question here, Osa, from uh, Valerie Hughes. And just to read Valerie's question, she says, allegations of widespread sexual abuse and exploitation in, on the part of government controlled Syria by the Syrian Arab Red Crescent employees was highlighted at a recent webinar organized by the Middle East, East Institute in Washington on the occasion of the publication of a report this week on UN procurement operation in Syria. Fairly long question. Might you uh, have, uh, could you highlight what the UN is doing to address these allegations, given the level of impunity of the Assad regime highlighted in the report? Um, Valerie is a friend of the Syrian community in Ireland. Valerie is a regular contributor to our, our institute and uh, raises this issue at every opportunity she can. So I just yeah. wondered if you have any information on that. For yeah, that. she should. She should. Uh, uh, and and I mean, I, to start with uh, the situation in Syria, which is really uh, dire, as we know, I think unfortunately has come a bit out of the spotlight because there's so much of other crises going on. And it's really important for that we raise it and, and talk about it uh, uh, also now with the crisis in, in, in or the women protests in Iran. So, so thank you for that question. Um, you and women does have a presence, but but um, not the biggest, I should say, in relation to that conflict. But um, perhaps if Valerie, Valerie is very welcome to contact me offline and we can give her uh, uh, the information on what we're doing in that particular case. I think that, that uh, um, yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Thank yeah. you very much. And Valerie, you can take note of that. I have another question here from Gerald Ahern. He says, I have commanded UN and EU forces in Africa. My experience and observations on the aims of UN women is often impeded by the lack of knowledge and corporate experience of diplomacy deployed UN women's personnel on the centers of influence within military forces and how within those forces their essential message can cascade down through the ranks of the military. So he's calling into question whether there's enough knowledge being deployed by UN women about, mm -hmm. I suppose, army systems. Have yeah. you any comment on that? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. It's a very supportive one. And um, uh, there are different efforts to um, um, uh, to 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 discuss and 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 uh, for, to increase awareness, obviously, in these missions. Uh, UN Women is uh, growing a lot, which I'm happy about. <laughs> but we we again we are not the biggest uh, UN agency, so sometimes, especially in very complicated. Uh, um, uh, areas it is difficult for us to so to speak be uh, everywhere i think th that the sec the secretary general has really called um called out the peacekeeper at well, all levels and all or leadership within the un when it comes to both parity and to uh, to uh, prioritize uh, um, sexual violence against women and and different um well, to to, um, to improve the situation uh, for women in armed conflict and to address atrocities and crimes committed uh, against them. And I, I do see that leadership is increasingly becoming female. I think that happen, that helps. And that is also good for you and women personnel to have those allies. They can also be men. But it is important to have presence of women in these settings. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can just say, you know, we, we really want to, to try to do what we can. But sometimes we are, because of our size, not the most uh, forceful, perhaps, UN agency, although we really do try, try and it should be an effort for the whole of the UN. Yes, thank you. I mean, I, I'm aware that more uh, women are getting involved in in, yes. in armies and in, in in military forces and that that has to help however following on from gerald hearn's que question uh, in my work as chair of the oversight uh, uh, committee on women peace and security um, we have been briefed on training that 
isn't happening with all the UN troops that are going around the world and that are, are taking part in, in peace missions. And sadly, um, there are instances of where UN personnel themselves are guilty of, of, yeah. of uh, sexual violence to women. Yeah. Are you satisfied that you have the ear of the heads of the army training schools, as it were, to get that kind of message across mostly to the men who are in the army tr troops? Well, I, you know, I, I really think from where I sit and when, when I travel to the countries where UN Women works, also conflict settings, that the message from the Secretary General and UN leadership that there is zero tolerance mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, it, I, is very strong. However, these are uh, very big operations and uh, it, is, it is really the also responsibility, you know, on all levels to transmit that message. So I, I am absolutely convinced that the Secretary General's message on this has gone to uh, leadership throughout the UN. Uh, whether it uh, actually functions the way it should, uh, I cannot guarantee, but it certainly, certainly should. And I think that when, uh, if UN personnel or peacekeepers commit these crimes, it has to be reported right away and it has to be dealt with very firmly because not only is that an atrocity in itself, it, it, it actually really goes back to the whole uh, legitimacy of the United Nations. And I think that uh, UN leadership uh, is very aware of that. So, so um, uh, that is a big issue. I can only say it's being discussed very much. Is, is, there's been, I don't know how many trainings, uh, discussions, also um, people responsible to implement this, this zero to tolerance policy. Um, but we also know with these issues, especially in settings where women have lower status, lower value, uh, and perhaps also when peacekeepers come from countries where these messages are not so frequent, uh, it is extra important that leadership um, uh, um, discusses this and just tells what is you know the message and and the rules here are you satisfied also that that where evidence of un personnel being involved in in these crimes that their leadership take them out of the system i mean we've heard of stories of those men staying where they are they're, yeah. and they're not sanctioned or taken home yeah. and put in front of their courts would, would i be right in that assessment uh, I think that things have shifted enormously. I think, for example, that the Me Too movement in 2017, where these issues really came up on the table, and that also brought some of these situations into to, to the spotlight. Uh, and, and I think also that it became very clear how, uh, first of all, devastating this is for the person who um, who, who suffers these crimes, um, but it also became clear how this, as I said again, how much this is related to the United Nations legitimacy in general. Uh, so uh, I, I do believe, I, I really do heartfelt believe that uh, the way of dealing with perpetrators is has improved enormously since uh, uh, during, let's say, the last five, six years. Uh, and not least because media has put spotlight on, on these occasions and also because uh, brave uh, survivors came forward and actually really uh, jeopardized uh, their, their own careers, perhaps, as, as crazy as it sounds. Uh, or, and, and whistleblowers both came forward and were also eventually listened to. I think that has changed very, very much the mentality. And as far as I know, uh, those who are found out uh, to having committed these kinds of crimes are let go uh, immediately and, and, and dealt with according to, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the manuals and the, the rules and regulations that we have. Yes, thank you very much. And um, I have a question here from Keelan O'Sullivan, who's our climate and development researcher in the Institute. And going back to something we touched on earlier, 
um, she asks, how can those documenting and reporting on CRSV, such as UN Women, find the right balance between investigating effectively and safely and engaging with the survivors without re-traumatizing them again? Yeah. Because that must be a very difficult area of, of work to be done. Yeah, yes, thank you for that question. And we have experts on that and also on the methodologies. Uh, and as you point out, that is really, really important to try to both separate, you know, counseling and treatment for, for the woman in question and the other one for justice. Uh, and for example, to try to find ways of effectively um, asking questions as few times as possible, for example, uh, and as I said, to provide uh, counselling and support in proper manners. So we have experts who are really good at doing this, and, and it's something that is uh, top of mind for them. And, and if it's helpful, I'm happy to provide more information on, on how that is done. Done. Yes, thank you very mm -hmm. much. I, I have another question here from Kean Fitzgerald. Um, sexual violence in particular conflict settings can often result in trauma that can reach across generations, in particular mm -hmm. where children are born of these crimes. Uh, and you've already hinted that where that happens, very often people are stigmatized and can't go back to their communities. How can support be provided for survivors that accounts for the potential for multi-generational trauma? I've read in some of the, of the writing on this whole issue that sometimes impregnating women to try and what they call clean yeah, out yeah. their system uh, yeah. is, is, is another weapon. And therefore yeah. those children and those women are completely ostracized, they can't go back home. So I just wonder what kind of areas can you actually take action in? Yeah, yeah, from UN Women's side and also together with other UN agencies like UNICEF and UNFPA where we have different roles in this. Uh, this is a well-known situation and I think uh, all of us who've been to uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, settings or um, for example, Northern Nigeria where, where uh, uh, terrorists are, are also committing uh, uh, terrible crimes against women and children uh, and sexual violence, you would see women and even girls because they're often very young and they would sit there and they have their their uh, little their toddler or newborn on their laps but as far away from their bodies as possible still on their laps mm. uh, and I mean that's a heartbreaking thing to see for both of them uh, and as you said uh, it is sometimes uh, for different um, reasons not possible for them to go back to their communities so for us it is important to go through what you know what kind of support can this uh, uh, girl or woman um, uh, benefit from the most what does she want obviously and how what can we provide uh, and how can um, is the is it possible to to have a reintegration or is is it possible to support her with livelihoods or what is the best way for her uh, and um, uh, i think that uh, in humanitarian work and and also in development because i mean these situations can occur also from civilian violence against women if, if you see what i mean mm. uh, uh, then I think we have underestimated psychosocial support for the longest time, and it's also not that's funded uh, that you know as often as it should. But I see that that is is uh, more and more part of of what we are doing and need to do. So I think we are very aware of this, and it depends, of course, is this a camp situation, refugee camp situation? Uh, is it in a terrorist zone? Uh, is it in a village? So it, it, uh, it, it kind of all uh, depends. Uh, sometimes women's groups, local women's groups are there to support and reach out. That's not uncommon. Then we can support them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it's, it's a frightening situation. I just want to re return to something, Osa. Um, COVID-19, did that cause an added problem for this kind of uh, violence and activity? Um, and did it diminish some of the 
advances that perhaps had been made in gender equality in some of the communities. I just wondered, had you any comments about uh, the effect of COVID-19 around the world? Because we've heard uh, I, in media reports and that, that it did have an effect. Oh, it certainly did. It went, uh, the world went backwards on gender equality. And we had already before the outbreak of COVID measured uh, uh, the Beijing conference, conference that was held in 1995. Mm. So we measured what happened um, uh, 25 years uh, later <clears throat> and then saw that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, we saw that the world in general was severely off track uh, in relation to the commitments from 1995 in terms of gender equality. We also measured the 1325 resolution plus 20 and saw the same thing that we see, saw legislation, we saw more of, of uh, reforms and more of talking, if you see what I mean. Talking is good, but it's not enough because what countries had not done uh, enough was to fund and create systems for implementation. And that was before COVID already. So when COVID hit, it was already very fragile when it comes to gender equality mm. uh, institutions, let's say, and, and, and implementation. And during COVID, we measured, uh, for example, that uh, violence from the side of men towards women who they live or lived with increased quite drastically um, in all countries that we could measure. And unfortunately, we've also seen that in many cases, the levels have remained higher, perhaps lower than during lockdowns, but in, they have remained higher than before COVID. Yeah. Uh, you also know that in many countries, women were, were forced, so to speak, to leave the labor market and stay at home to do schooling or uh, other things without having any say uh, and uh, so in general there are many reasons for that but also uh, uh, women's women were also socioeconomically harder hit by covid uh, so it is really important that the world uh, tries to uh, invest in this and and build stronger societies in terms of gender equality and i i think that you know i guess many of us certainly understand why um, governments feel they need to uh, support uh, ukraine right now for example and and um, beef up their own um, defense and so on. Uh, I mean, that's for member states to decide. But uh, we are worried that we do see a trend again where we know that investments in uh, socioeconomic systems and gender equality is much needed. But we fear that instead the money goes elsewhere, for example, into increased uh, expenditure for defense uh, and, and, and weapons mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and other uh, um, uh, priorities which are not related to um, gender equality and thus might not help to keep societies together and to implement rights. So that's another reason that it's good to highlight this and, and, and uh, have dialogues around that and remind Yes, I mean, there's another comment here about the collapse of the Islamic State and the women and children who are in the detention camps. Yes, yes. we've heard we've heard awful stories, but I, I, I hope that maybe the humanitarian organizations who are working around, maybe not inside the camps, but in a lot of the, the periphery areas of the camps can lessen some of the danger zones we've heard of stories of women being afraid to go to the use the toilets and uh, not letting their children out at night and things like that because they're they are areas where they will be attacked i mean the un women must have some role in in talking to the the people who run those camps to try and yeah. lessen every opportunity there is for sexual violence yes no absolutely we do as part of of the un system we certainly do and um, uh, but that's also a very complicated and protracted situation and where uh, many of these women have not uh, been able uh, to return to to their countries as you know and and but we are working together with the, the rest of the UN system to address this situation um, as well as we can. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I just just wanted to just raise one maybe very brief issue. Maybe you could just talk to me for a minute about Afghanistan. It's kind of because of Ukraine, yeah. it's sort of gone off the agenda and we, Ireland has taken in people from Afghanistan, particularly um, women and, and children um, who are in particular, particularly in, in certain careers, had very good jobs and now they are in danger. Is there any kind of dialogue going on with the Taliban with regards to um, the role they have with women? I mean, they've closed schools, there's there's terrible hunger, but there's also sexual violence. So just maybe as a, as a last question, I might ask you, have you anything you wanted to share with us about Afghanistan? No, absolutely. Uh, that's one of the biggest programs that we have, obviously. And the situation is extremely difficult for women's rights because the Taliban have deprived women of their rights and, and uh, for example, not reinstalled uh, education for girls all over the country uh, or in big parts in, of the country, they haven't. Uh, so um, I want to also thank Ireland for its leadership in relation to the new UNAMA resolution, uh, the resolution that leads the UN work in the country because it has strong gender equality language and that's not just language, it really helps to, um, to, to prioritize within that mission. Uh, it now has a new, um, a new head uh, of mission and um, uh, we have been engaging uh, both before the General Assembly and during the open debate in the Security Council and also in other times with Afghan women who are either in the dias diaspora or in the country. Mm -hmm. And um, they are very adamant, as are many ma member states, to not legitimize, acknowledge uh, in, in any way um, uh, give some kind of power to the Taliban that they shouldn't have. What uh, the uh, UN uh, needs to do, however, is for the uh, for for women and men, but it's you need different things to be able to to um, access humanitarian services. You need to go to the um, to the uh, regions and and they are discussed with local. Uh, Taliban uh, to uh, just negotiate the opening, for example, of shelters for families or shelters for women and so on. Uh, so UN Women's work in uh, Afghanistan is to a large extent about uh, supporting women's organizations and women's leaders who are there, try to help women's uh, livelihoods when possible, and also try to reopen shelters and centers that we had for women uh, before the Taliban took over. And it functions in some parts of the country and in some parts it does not. Uh, so, but. We're working really hard there and we're very grateful for uh, for Ireland's support. Uh, and that's a, a long term job. And I agree with you, it's unfortunate that it has become a bit quiet around Afghanistan because the problems are actually very severe. Mm. Just finally, could I just say from Pauline Conway, who's a former ambassador, she she says there hasn't been much mention of the conflict related GBV in Tigray, in the Tigray yes. war in Ethiopia. Yes. I have read about yes. it and it is just horrendous what's going on there. It is, yes. No, it certainly is. And and uh, there was a report that came, came out uh, from the um, uh, this, uh, the group in the, in the Human Rights Council, I forget their name now, uh, on, on human rights in, uh, in Ethiopia and Tigray. Uh, they came out with a report just the other day. Uh, and as you say, uh, we've also read before through the special um, representative on sexual violence and armed conflict. It is, uh, it is, it's terrible what is happening there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you and women has an office, which is uh, also a pretty good size for us uh, in Ethiopia. So again, we try to respond to that uh, with the rest of the system, but it is also difficult to even get into Tigray, uh, uh, as we know. 
but we, we, that is certainly a priority for us and something that just before I went in here, I had new, uh, new messages from colleagues in Ethiopia on this situation, since we know that, that uh, uh, the uh, attacks and violence has restarted, unfortunately. And, uh, but we also know that there are intense from the African Union side of peace talks. And um, for us, it's important to influence and support uh, uh, the women's rights perspective of those talks. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Osa Ede. Unfortunately, there are more questions, but we're running out of time now. Uh, I mean, we really could nearly go through each of those individual countries you listed and, and hear the, the horrors of what's going on. But I want to thank you most sincerely for your expertise and for your presentation today. It's frightening. And for those of us who have the, the, the joy of living in a safe country, mostly where we don't get attacked and we, we aren't in conflict, um, it, it, you have given us a lot of food for thought. So I want to thank you most sincerely and wish you continued success. You have here and there given us little glimmers of, of, of improvements <laughs> and hopes that things are happening. Um, I want to thank Keelan O'Sullivan who helped prepare for this meeting today to Lorcan, who looked after the, the IT section of it. And to all of our viewers today, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your interest. And thank you, of course, to Ambassador Michael Gaffey for, for being here with us. And I wish you all a very good afternoon. And thank you again, Osa. Thank you. No, thanks. Thanks to my, so much to all of you. It, it was an honor to be here, as I said. And really, if there are concrete unanswered questions, it's absolutely OK and invited <laughs> to send those per mail and then our experts can get in touch. So thank you, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much indeed. And good afternoon to you and good Happy afternoon weekend. to our all audience.